Grade 10 scientist, Mr. Kleiman here. I just wanted to take a little bit of time today to work you through some of the basics of plant anatomy and physiology. We've talked quite a bit about animals, but what we often forget is that this planet is filled with such a tremendous variety of different living things, and they are just as alive as we are. And so their bodies are designed around their life needs. And so the course ends here with a little look at one of my favorite things, which is plants. And you know, most of us think of plants as kind of these inanimate things that don't move or do anything. But I really encourage you to open your eyes and have a look at them. And please watch a couple of those documentaries that we've posted for you this week uh, so that you can get a sense of how they move in their own time. When you see a plant moving in time-lapse photography, you can really get a sense that though they don't use muscles to move and they don't use brains to think, they certainly are doing very similar things to what you and I do in our lives. So I'm gonna break down for you some of the main curriculum points here, and I hope you're gonna take some interest from it. First, let's try to break down the basic body of a plant. And this particular plant that you see on the screen here clearly is a tomato plant. Uh, it's not representative of all plants, but it's got a basic layout that can help us get some of the main parts. So the first thing that I want to point out is that plants grow fundamentally differently from you and me. I kind of grow everywhere at the same time, and we grow along some developmental time scale. Plants grow individually from separate buds, and inside of those buds is essentially stem cells, these unspecialized cells that can turn into whatever tissues a plant needs. Now, it's not exactly the same as our stem cells, and so they get a special name. They're called meristems, and if you look around this plant, you'll find them everywhere. There are apical meristems, which mean that they're at the very top or at the very bottom of that plant. So those are kind of growing tips. And then you have these lateral or sometimes called axillary meristems. And you'll generally find them at the base of every leaf and of every branch. And so this allows plants to grow both tall and to grow wide. And what do they generally grow from those different meristems? Well, each one responds to their environmental conditions. If there's not a lot of light, maybe a meristem is gonna grow into a new shoot to reach for the light. If there is enough light, maybe that meristem is gonna turn into a leaf. Uh, and when conditions are right, and the plant has gathered enough of its resources and sugars and has photosynthesized well and established itself, maybe one of those meristems is gonna turn into a flower. And I hope you know that once those flowers get pollinated, the seeds inside start to grow, and oftentimes, if it's a flowering plant, it will also produce either a fruit or a nut uh, that is edible, where that flower used to be. Uh, and of course, that's only the above ground portion of this plant. Let's remember that there is a tremendously important part of the plant underground. And of course, that's the root system where it's going to soak up water and absorb nutrients. It's also going to anchor that plant in the soil. And quite frankly, it holds the topsoil in place. Without those roots, uh, we actually wouldn't have nearly as much topsoil. They would run off uh, when it rains. And so that's the kind of basic lay of the land for the body of a plant. Um, but those different body parts are made out of fundamentally three different kinds of tissues. And if you remember from our previous lessons on anatomy and physiology, tissues just means groups of cells of a particular specialized type. And so there are three main categories of plant tissues. There's dermal tissues, very much like how we have skin. A plant has a skin. Uh, there's vascular tissues, uh, just like how you and I have arteries and veins to carry your blood around. Uh, plants have vascular tissue, tubes inside, to carry water and sugar uh, throughout their bodies. And then the rest of the plant is filled with what we call ground tissue. And of course, each one of these has its own subdivisions of subtypes of these tissues. So let's try to break them down. What do we use them for? Well, those dermal tissues uh, are that skin of the plant. And for the most part, uh, the most important part of what the dermis does 
in a plant is it produces wax to make it waterproof. And I know that you like to think that plants love water, and they do, but if you water the leaves or the stems of a plant, they can't absorb it. Why? Because generally above ground, water would evaporate from cells way too quickly and your plants would dry out and die. Their strategies for survival are to keep all of their water absorption underground and pretty much the entirety of the above ground part of the plant is covered in wax and is fully waterproof. Uh, here's a little challenge for you. Take a little bottle of water with a spray top on it and spray it on the leaves of a plant and see how they behave. And I bet what you're gonna see is that it doesn't absorb at all. That water will beat up into little tiny droplets and will roll off the plant. Try it yourself. Inside of that plant is that vascular tissue and there's two main types. There's xylem that carries water up from the roots into the leaves and there's phloem that carries sugar away. And why water up and sugar away? Well, I hope you know that plants don't eat food like you and I do for the most part. What they do is they go through photosynthesis. They take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from underground. And through a chemical reaction, they can combine those two ingredients in order to form sugars, namely glucose. So they need some system to carry that water up and in their leaves, they're going to absorb that other ingredient, carbon dioxide. And then together, uh, inside of the leaf, they'll produce those sugars, which is going to feed the plant and allow the plant to build its body. So they need another system of tubes to carry away the end product. That's the phloem. And the rest of the cell doing all, or the rest of the plant, I should say, doing all the rest of its functions is ground tissue. And I kind of think of that as filler tissues. Uh, but in general, that's the structural part of the plant that holds it upright, and there are highly specialized ground tissues inside that leaf where photosynthesis occurs. And so the last type of tissue that's very much worth mentioning again is that meristematic tissue, meristems. When I think of a meristem, I think about buds, and these are just the growing tips. They're non-specialized cells that are going to be able to grow into whatever the plant wants. And so there's a nice little review diagram for you of all the different things that a plant cell might turn into, uh, that a meristem, I should say, might grow into. They can stay inactive if conditions are not there for them to grow. They can grow new shoots, they can grow new roots, they can grow leaves, or they can grow flowers. And in this way, two individuals with the exact same DNA, two cloned plants, even side by side, may look very different from each other as their individual buds and meristems respond differently to what's going on in the environment. If one bud gets crushed and can't grow, another one will take its place and grow instead. So we call this modular growth. What I mean by modular is that plants grow in these discrete little sections from each meristem. And so here's kind of the lay of the land for a basic plant. You'll have these nodes, and each node is basically where you find a meristem. And in between those nodes, we'd call it the uh, internode stem or the internode space. So here's a node that has grown a leaf, and there's an uh, axillary or lateral meristem waiting to grow something else if conditions are right. Here's another one and another one, and those can grow either continuously or seasonally. So let's have a look at uh, the branch of a tree. And if you look closely at any branch from any tree, you'll find some really distinctive characteristics. Now I know there's a lot of info here, so let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, this little guy here is called a bud scar, and essentially that is a line left from where the axillary meristem started out last winter. So as this plant emerges out of spring, it starts to grow from that bud up this way. In other words, this is the new branch that grew all through this year's growing season from winter up to the previous winter. And during that time, as it grew, it produced some other side branches. Now these are being called leaf scars, but when this thing was green and still growing this year, this probably would have been the location of where there was a leaf. And of course, in the fall, that leaf has fallen off, but what didn't fall off is this little axillary meristem. That's where next year's growth is gonna come from. So if you think about it, anywhere where there was a leaf, 
is where a branch next year might grow. So here you have the apical meristem and the axillary or lateral meristems where all of the leaves were. And now we can work our way down the plant. That was this year's growth. And from here to here must be last year's growth. And there you can see one of these axillary meristems has turned into a side branch. Okay, that's another bit of this year's growth. So it grew both here and here this year. If we go back even further, okay, two years ago it grew from here to here. And you can actually uh, trace back the growth of plants in different years. You can even see, was it a good year or a bad year for growth? Did it grow a lot or just a little bit? And finally, uh, I like to look at a, a very different kind of plant, uh, grasses, as another example of how this same basic layout can be slightly rearranged to make uh, a whole different kind of plant. So what's really neat about grasses is that they don't have an apical meristem on top. Instead, they keep their meristems just underground. So when they want to grow new above ground parts, it emerges from underneath the earth where their roots are. Uh, the problem with this is that they generally can't grow very tall very fast, and they certainly can't grow from last year onwards even higher. But the advantage is if something bites off the top, the meristem is unaffected and this can continue to grow. Grass has evolved in a symbiotic relationship with grazing animals. And so if a cow, let's say, is grazing in a pasture and it happens to bite a little sapling of a tree, it will bite off the uh, apical meristem. And as a result, that tree can no longer grow taller and that tree will die. But as it eats the grass, it will be nutritious for the cow and the grass plant will be basically unaffected. It can grow back those leaves that it's lost with minimal damage. And so in this way they have a partnership. Grasslands need herbivores in order to thrive. Okay, so these plants have developed all sorts of different strategies to use this modular growth to their advantage. Now let's have a look inside the most important organ of a plant. Let's look inside the leaf. What you're looking at here is a diagram called a cross section. And that basically means that what if I cut a little cube out of a leaf so that I could see inside of it to look at the different parts. And let's see how all of those tissues come together to form an organ that's specifically designed to do photosynthesis. Because after all, that's what leaves are there for. Uh, the first tissue we'll look at is this dark green one on the outer edge, and that is the dermis. And you can see that it's in two layers. It's got a layer down here of cells, we'll call that the epidermis, and those cells are excreting wax. This is a non-living layer of literally just wax molecules that waterproofs the outside of this cell. We call that the cuticle. Now what I don't love about this particular artist's rendition of the leaf is that they've drawn it in green. Because in reality, it's not green at all. The epidermis and the cuticle together are actually completely clear. It's like a window. That's not where photosynthesis is occurring. That is simply a protective layer that's also waterproofed. Where the actual photosynthesis is happening, the only part of the leaf, in fact, that is green, is all of this ground tissue inside. And this ground tissue is so highly specialized to do photosynthesis and is so green uh, that it gets its own unique name. We call it mesophyll cells. And there's two main types packed along the top edge of the leaf as closely as they possibly can side by side with no space between them are the palisade mesophylls named after palisade soldiers that stand shoulder to shoulder. The problem with this is that while we can certainly get light in there and we can deliver water to those cells, that other ingredient, carbon dioxide, would have a hard time getting between cells that are so packed. So along the bottom edge of the palisade mesophyll layer is this layer of spongy mesophyll. And it's called spongy because it has air spaces in between the cells uh, to allow for CO2, the other ingredient to make sugar, to get in there as well. And so those leaves on a sort of microscopic level are a little bit spongy. And so how do we get that last ingredient inside of the leaf? 
Well, it's very challenging. You need holes in the leaf where air can come in. And here are those holes, but the problem is water can come out through evaporation. And so leaves are leaky. And this is a main source of how plants can dry out. Remember, they don't want their leaves to dry out. They need to use that water for photosynthesis. So you'll only find those holes not in the top of the leaf where the sun is hitting it, but on the underside of the leaf to minimize water loss through evaporation, but allow for gases to come in. Okay, CO2 in particular is what they're looking for. The other thing is that a waste product of photosynthesis is oxygen and they need to get rid of that so it can come out through these holes again. And so the final thing that's really cool about these pores, these holes in the underside of the leaf, is that when photosynthesis isn't going on or conditions are not right for photosynthesis, they can close them. They're kind of like smart pores where they only open when photosynthesis is going to take place and when it's not taking place, they can close those holes. And those specialized holes give, are given the fancy name of stomata. One stomate and many stomata. Each stomata consisting of just two cells called guard cells. And when they swell up, it closes. And then when they release some water, they can open up again. The very last tissue that we can see inside of this plant are these vascular bundles. So we've got the dermis, uh, the dermal tissue and the cuticle for waterproofing and protection. We've got the mesophyll for doing photosynthesis and gas exchange. And the last ingredient, of course, is to bring water up from the roots. And once we've made sugar here, to be able to take it away to the rest of the plant where it's needed. And so in these little bundles, you might think of them like the veins of the plant. Uh, you've got both xylem and phloem. Think about biting into a piece of celery and you get those long strings stuck in your teeth. Well, that's just one of these bundles containing the xylem and the phloem. Think about that network that looks kind of like a spider web of veins in a leaf that holds it out and open. They're tough and they're rigid structures uh, that are not only used for bringing in these materials, but also for holding the plant uh, upright and in its shape. Okay, so the main site then for photosynthesis is this ground tissue that we call mesophyll. Um, why are those air spaces there? Well, that's for gas exchange, CO2 in, and oxygen, and some water out. Now, you may think that that's just accidental, uh, that that's a bad thing for the plant, and to some degree it is. We're going to revisit in a minute how the plants use that water loss to their advantage. Okay, so here's a little summary of those two main types of vascular tissues. You've got xylem, which is just dead and hollowed out cells connected into a, a continuous tube, and water always goes in one direction, from the roots all the way up to the leaves, whereas the phloem is a little more complex. These are living cells with what we call companion cells helping them out. And why they're alive and need companion cells is because they're kind of decision-making cells. They need to not only move sugar around in this central tube, but they need to move it to the right place. They need to make decisions about where to move the end products of photosynthesis. So phloem is alive and moving sugary water, and xylem is dead and hollow. It's just straws sucking water up from underground. One more quick look at those stomata. Here you can see the guard cells swollen up and open, which is allowing for gas exchange to happen through this pore. And when they become flaccid, meaning that they've lost some of their water, they can seal up shut. And so the stomata can open to allow photosynthesis to occur and can close when it's not going to occur. Here's the crazy thing. Think about how far that water needs to travel to get from, let's say, underground to the top of a tall tree. And now think about the fact that you can't hear that tree doing anything. There's no pumps. There's no uh, uh, muscles moving. How is it pumping water from underground to the top? And the answer is actually quite beautiful. 90% of the water that's ever going to reach the leaves is not going to be used for photosynthesis it will evaporate from those leaves when the stomata open. And this works very much like you sucking on a straw. By removing water from the top, 
you draw water up from the bottom, and you can do that in complete silence. As water evaporates from the leaves of a plant, that draws more water in from underground up through the xylem. And so in this way, plants can perpetually be drawing up water so long as their stomata is open. Um, one of the amazing things to think about then is that that means that plants are getting access to water underground that would not have evaporated and causing it to evaporate above ground. They create their own humidity and they actually, they actually ultimately lead to making their own rain. When you think of a tropical rainforest, the only reason why it rains every day in that region of the world isn't just because of where it is relative to the equator, but in large part those daily rains and that high humidity are the direct result of a climate created by plants, and in particular by this process of transpiration, or the sucking up of water through evaporation at the leaves. This is an incredibly important process in the water cycle. So that's what plants are built around. It's photosynthesis. Their whole body is designed around maximizing the amount of intake of carbon dioxide and water so that they can produce glucose and that getting rid of that waste product oxygen. That's the key ingredient that plants are designed to make all day every day. And what do they do with it? Not exactly the same thing that you and I do with it. You and I eat sugars exclusively for energy, but plants only use a very tiny percentage of their glucose for energy. The vast majority of the glucose molecules that they create, they use to build their bodies out of. The cell wall that surrounds every one of the plant cells is constructed out of glucose molecules. Remember, plants don't have bones. Their entire structure is derived from that cell wall. And so that cell wall, in a way, is their skeleton. When you look at a plant, they're kind of built out of glucose, which is an amazing thing to think about. The plants are building their bodies out of carbon that they derive from the air and from water they derive from the rain. Okay? That's what the majority of the body of the plant is. That's why when you grow a plant in a pot, the soil level doesn't go down as the plant gets bigger. It's actually just adding more carbon to that system by pulling it out of the atmosphere. And when that plant dies and decomposes, it will add a new layer of fresh topsoil uh, on top of the previous one. So next time you go outside and you're walking around in the soil, recognize that what you're standing on is layer upon layer upon layer of many, many hundreds of thousands or millions of generations of dead plant bodies that have been decomposed and their parts have been left behind. And so that last bit then, where does this particular process take place? Why is the plant green? Because in the mesophyll cells, packed, packed, packed in there is an organelle inside of each cell that you and I don't have. And it's called a chloroplast. And this fancy little organelle uh, contains a molecule that you and I don't produce called chlorophyll. And that thing is exceptionally good at absorbing red and blue light. And it reflects the greens and some of the yellows. So as a result, we see green, and that's because plants are kind of eating the red and the blue light. They're putting that red and blue light into glucose. It's being absorbed. Uh, so this incredible structure is so critical to the functioning of plants, and how they position it is so important to how they feed themselves. Uh, so the stems of the plant really are just there to provide structural support and get those leaves where they need to get to expose their chloroplasts appropriately towards the light. They reach, they stretch, they overtop, they climb, they battle. Sometimes they protect their stems with sharp thorns and with poisons so that they can reach for the light in peace. Uh, they also contain those vascular bundles inside that will carry water and sugar around. And then that last and super important part is the underground portion of the plant, the roots. And you may think of it just as kind of a sponge that absorbs water and some nutrients from, from the soil, but there's so much more than that. Uh, there are also places where they can store some of their sugars for harder times that makes it a bit harder for a predator to get access to them. There are drills that can push through clay and rock and uh, break concrete and bend fences. 
Uh, it's uh, incredible what uh, the different structures and types of roots can all do. But the basics are that they've got this hard root cap and right behind it is that apical meristem where new growth is going to come. And as they grow, they push that wedge into the soil and they can dig deep where it would take me a lot of muscle to put a shovel into. That little tiny plant all day long can edge its way in and go deeper than I could shovel. Uh, and so let's look at these different types of roots, right? You've got uh, fibrous roots, which is what you'll find in grass. They branch out thinly and search for uh, water and food around the surface. And then you've got these big hardy wedges, these tap roots like a carrot uh, that can go much deeper underground and access resources that these ones can't. Uh, this is what dandelions are like. When you pull up a dandelion with its full root, it's that big tap root. And so the dandelions can grow in the same place as the grass without having to directly compete with them for water and for food because that dandelion dandelion taproot goes deep down below the grass. And finally, you gotta love the potatoes, right? The french fries, the potato chips, that starch, right? Which is just uh, glucose being stored for energy rather than as a cell wall. And boy, is it ever delicious. Plants will pack those both into their seeds and store some for itself uh, in their roots. And here you can see the roots of a potato plant with these massive bulbs packed full of starch that are quite delicious. So there's way more to the world of plants and I really encourage you to take a bit of time this week to watch some of those super cool documentaries that we've shared. But that's my intro to the basics of their anatomy and physiology. I hope you found that interesting and helpful, and I hope that you actually go outside and have a look at some of these plants and think about them maybe in a bit of a different light than you did before. Thanks for listening.